Um, my name is David Neely, and I am currently, um, actually, I'm currently looking at, uh, I'm a teacher, educator by trade. I've been a principal uh, and, a, and a educator for 20 years. I lived in Japan for the past 10 years, so we've come back about a year ago and got involved in some board stuff, and now I'm just doing some various consulting work and different things like that as well. Um, hope we can talk about some of that and some of the kind of the ideas. Um, that's basically it. I mean, we could talk more throughout the conversation, but that's that's kind of the basics. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And full disclosure, Dave and I have been friends for a long time, man. So this is one of those conversations where it's just like, this would be a conversation we would have sitting in my backyard or if we went to, you know, sit at like sunrise and just <laughs> have some jerk chicken or something. <laughs> this is what we would be doing. So, um, and you know, it's funny on that, on that tip, we we're walking the other day past, um, your old street, um, in Meadowvale here. And I think, uh, Jared Overy was like, uh, he lived on your yeah. street and we we're talking about how my wife and I were saying, if he didn't have birthday parties and like Valentine's Day parties and stuff in back in the day, we never really would have connected. And then yeah. later at grade eight, you know what I mean? So this is a grade five, six, seven sort of thing we just saw in passing at those events. So I look forward to crossing paths with you at those events before yeah. we connected later. Um, so it's just interesting how those, uh, those, those points intersect. But it was before that actually in elementary, because I was going to a private school you were going to, to settlers. Some people were going to the other schools. Like we were all spread out. It wasn't until that point in time, actually, that it really converged. Yeah. yeah so it was yeah. actually it was actually earlier that we actually right. met each other. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We. So, I mean, that, that, it's funny when we were talking about that because it's really interesting to see, you know, like I, I like now with a lot of the different reports from different boards that come out and you know address things like anti-black racism and just things like that. I start to like, it causes a lot of self-reflection. And kind yeah. of a lot of like look like reflecting back on how it was then and how some people were directed in some ways and other people weren't and what's the context it just it really you know caused you to rethink kind of like yeah. your past and kind of what what happened and what and yeah just an interesting kind of reflective piece it's yeah. funny like yeah yeah no no, no go ahead. go over that no I was saying like a lot of times like people look at this board like a lot of the board evaluations and it's not just the peel a lot of the other ones and you think oh wow this is so bad for people who have nothing no idea but for for black many people of color it's kind of almost a reflection like well well where was you start to kind of point out just the things that happened good and bad yes. in your journey like, right and, and 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 good and bad in other people's journey who you were friends with right know? exactly yeah okay so just to bring everyone who's watching up to speed here uh one of the things that happened in our local area there's a school board that posted a tweet saying that they have acknowledged that there has been systemic racism within their board. And they've, they've, they've posted like a multi-page report on their action plan and basically just confessed that this is what has been happening in our board systemically. And I received a personal, you know, I'm not personal, but I received an email a while back that they were doing a survey and asked about like our children's experience. Have I experienced it? They reach out to teachers to get their experience as as educators. Like, has there been any roadblocks? They looked at suspension rates among different um, individuals, people of color, and all these different things. And it was a very thorough, exhaustive um, investigation, basically that that the board went through. And it, and it surfaced to see that there had been examples of um, anti you know, uh, systemic racism towards black people like it wasn't even just like teachers students whatever so that's the context that we're talking in uh, amongst these guys is just the fact that we we witnessed that happen in our local area while all these different things police brutality is happening in the whole world and we want to sit back and say nothing's happening in canada you know there's some concrete evidence of of systems that have admitted that this is what is happening within their system um so at the same time that's happening right now it, like Damon says, you get to this point of reflection where you're like, you know, has it always been like that? People are quick to say it's always been like that. And the board's been like that forever. You know, is that true? Yeah, and I think it, 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 I think more than is it true, uh, because I think that, that the onus isn't on, like I'm not, not correct, but the onus isn't on uh, us to try to prove that it's true. It's more along the lines of where we know that systemic racism has existed over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So where and in what manner? Um, and, and, and is it a better question? 
Okay. Um, but I think all this, like, as I think one thing I just want to bring up with Martin that you could, we, we had talked about before is that it's, it's very strange for me because I'm, my background is my, my dad essentially came to America, Canada because of racism in America. Uh, yeah. Long story, read the book, The Stone Thrower, if you really want to hear our family story. But really, he, he lost, he won all 35 and 0, never lost a game in college. It was a top quarterback, but they didn't want to draft him because he was black. So he came to the CFL. So my story is kind of this blended Canadian American history kind of story. Mm -hmm. And then I spent, got married, it came back after I went to got educated at the university in the States, spent 10 years here, and then I moved to Japan for 10 years. So I've been in Japan for 10 years of this last part of my life and then come back this past year, which is like it, where everything has kind of exploded. So it's this, it's this odd kind of mix now in my brain and in my like of, of kind of multi multi layered experiences yes. as a black person that gives me a kind of a, a I, I want to say unique and special perspective, but yes. some people would say a messed up perspective, but it just, <laughs> it has created this kind of world in me about, you know, we have this this Asia and this international and how things operate there. And we have this American system and we have this Canadian system and all three of those are part of my world. Yeah. So it's kind of this convergence of, 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 of a racial perspective that I, I would argue is, is very unique. So do you feel like sometimes when people are speaking on behalf of black people that they're actually speaking on behalf of black people in the United States or like, you mean, do you feel like, like we're speaking too broad at times when we try and address this issue of race? No, because I, because I think that, you know, it still comes down when we go back to it. All of this stems from colonialism, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where the common ground, where many people from African nations, many people from Canada, America, that's where our common ground lies. But the okay. experience is different. It is different. I mean, and my, my, you ask my father that all the time. It's why he wanted us being raised here rather than the U.S., Yes. So yes, systemic racism exists everywhere, but it's at different levels. If, if you start going to like certain countries, like whether you, if you compare South Africa to to Canada to the to the U.S. Mm -hmm. to all these other places, it's it's so different. But at the same time, it's the same. And I don't mean to be kind of vague there. I'm just trying, talking more along the line. So it's like there's this there's common grounds and there's things that are uniquely different to each each country. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, uh, Labrice isn't on here right now, but she's a plaza structure who lived in, in different places in the U.S. and then moved to Switzerland after being married. And it's really because she didn't want to raise her daughters in that in that U.S. mindset, yep. um, right? So some people pluck themselves out of the context. Other people choose to fight within the context. Um, but they recognize that that context is there. Well, I'll, I'll give you a tangible story. When I went to the U.S., I was on a, on a football scholarship to the University of Toledo. And I just emailed my friend Chris Wallace a little a little while back because I remember a story where one of the players on the team started start like this lady said to him, "Hey boy," and he just went off like started throwing water bottles and just chasing after her. And there was three of us, all black, standing there. Yeah. And one of the guys said, "You know what? He don't, like don't worry. He didn't mean anything by it." And I said, "Yeah, he didn't mean anything by it." And Chris Wallace, who's black, turned to the one guy and said, "Ely," you know, he turned to me and he said, "Ely, you're a Canadian." So I, 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 I get, I, I, I'll, I'll let you off right now. But he turned to the other guy and he said, you know better. And the guy immediately responded and said, yeah, actually, you know, you're right. You're right. You're right. I know better. I know better. Yeah. And so I, I realized in that moment in time that things were different. Like the perspective right. is different and there's words that are language. -y. But over the course of those four years, that's when I got my lesson in real, the American side of racism versus the Canadian side. And again, yes. I don't want to downplay either ones because people will get really offended and upset and mad, right? They get angry when you start saying, well, no, it's the exact same. I'm not saying that racism, hate, racism is racism and it's hatred is hatred, but it's, there is differences. Yes. There's, there's significant differences that people have to understand when you're comparing the U.S. and American history and, and those kind of things. So anyway, that's just a little bit. Yeah, no, 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 that doesn't make sense. Well, Rod said it yesterday, and I don't know like, what you think about this, but he used the example of we money, lost $200 million. Mm -hmm. And then the U.S., they'll be like, well, I don't really like that Martin guy, but that's $200 million, so I'll listen to him. Whereas yeah. in Canada, the corporations are still like, well, he's an entry level economist, you know, analyst, so I don't really want to listen to that entry level black guy. Yeah. And they won't receive that. So, like, Raz's frustration with the Canadian economy is that people were too caught up in people's level and skin color to make a decision, where in the US is almost like they're greedy enough to listen to black people, if I was to yeah. simplify, grossly simplify what he was saying. But, like, there's different levels of, of, of what they see and say. Yeah, well, I think, and I think in Canada, it's like it's, 
it, it, the expectation is a nice conformity, right? There's, yes. there's always the expression of a nice conformity. Oh, you're like, they're really into like, oh, this is a nice black guy. He can be part of our system. And then you have to become part of that system. Whereas America in numbers, even though the, the, the numbers allow for almost a rebellion and a fight against that system, that doesn't necessarily, that doesn't mean that it's easier by any means. Yeah. But again, there are places where there are black people in high, high positions, even cities where you have more opportunities to become CEO, you have more opportunities where you, it may not be in the system that you want, but there are system possibilities. Yes. Whereas in Canada, it's very, the system is already kind of set and it's just like, this is a nice system. It's a nice system. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, because it's a nice system, why would you want to break anything of this part of this nice system? Whereas in America, it's like, I don't like this system. I'm going to go at it. And you can actually develop a larger, like, kind of allyship of people of the same education, like a historically yes. black, black colleges. You've got there's just a little bit more of addition for the fight. Um, right. I think that's, a, that's just, I mean, that's, that's a kind of this oversimplified, oversimplified right comparison because uh, okay. people will disagree people will kind of disagree and probably say well that's not true canada is mm -hmm. very racist and they're very mean but again in for the sake of oversimplification that's kind of i think the big some of the basic okay things. so then so let's dive deep on the education side of it for a second if, just to give an american background american background location is everything right Ta tax dollars go into your education system so if you live in the inner city right off the bat you're getting lo lower level textbooks teachers are paid less you know, so right there, you can very clearly see where systemic racism. It's almost, it's almost, it's so obvious, right? Okay. In Canada, we're we're we're, e we're pretty much equally funded. Okay. So so all across, everybody receives the same fund, like approximately the same funding. Yes. Everybody has access to approximately the same level of standards and education, and so people, when they come into where, where you where you don't see it, is people are like, hey, I teach every I teach all my class the same way. I, 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 all kids are equal in my class, mm -hmm. right? All kids get this education. All, I have the same expectation for all students. That's what you see in Canada. Where yes. in the U U.S., it's kind of like, I don't even have the tools to be able to, to teach those kids the right way. So you have someone like LeBron James, who's brilliant. I think one of the, one of the greatest people of all time, not just athletes, who yes. can start a school with a different vision with the resources that he has, right? And he makes a right. difference, right? right. But right. in Canada, they have the same resources. But the problem is people aren't willing to acknowledge that they automatically think black people aren't as smart as white people. So when they That's approach the things, yeah, the assumption is this kid can't do it, mm. rather than this kid can do it. So okay. you say, well, the kid's kind of struggling with a C, you know what? He should just go into the lower level stream. He should go in the easy stream. Rather than saying, wow, I see potential in this kid. Let's push him to the academic stream. And let's like where I would see a kid and I'm like, let's push him to the academic stream. Let's see how far he could go. Yes. Right? That's those subtle, subtle changes are what make like in Canada, people are afraid to address that. They're afraid yes. to address the fact that they have perceptions that allow them to think differently about black people and about black students i've heard like numerous people have written to me and said i've seen on people's walls and stuff well if people were just just if black people just kind of worked harder they and, and they weren't as lazy they would be able to do whatever and i'm like mm -hmm. what every black yeah. person i know works hard i mm -hmm. I, I, I i've i can't i can't i can't tell you the like like most black but many of the black people work harder than the other people i know because they have to <laughs> so like that, that right. kind of mindset yeah. that's because that's what i know we're programmed with that yes so Right. So then, so that's, that's frustrating, right? Because everyone <coughs> uses that same example and say, well, that's, you know, every teacher would say, well, that's not me. I'm giving everyone equal opportunity. Yeah. But they're well, really not. No, they're not. And I think, I think that's one of the, one of the problems is that when you don't have people of color in like, let's say leadership positions, right. They're not, they're not part of the, even the teacher training or the, the ministry training, let's just say, to be able to give a different perspective. I can't tell you how many meetings that I've been a part of where it's, where generally speaking, it's white leadership telling people how to, how to do anti-black racism. What? Yes. It's like, right. it's like, it's like, it's like we, this is, this is what we actually are experts on. <laughs> yes. like this is, this, this is what we actually know what we're talking about. And we're barely invited to the table. 
And some right. of that is just historically, people just aren't ready to relinquish control. Like they just, and that's where, again, we talk about systemat- systemic racism. It's the inability of to be able to relinquish to control and to add more voices to the table. Right. People aren't asking you to do exactly, tell do exactly what, what they want you to do. They're asking for an equal voice at the table. So we bring right. up ideas and we facilitate ideas and we begin to share those ideas and work together to make change. Yes, exactly. Um, Missy has a comment here. Equal opportunity framed through their experience does not lend itself to equal footing. So can you, see, can you repeat that again? It's, it's, again? it's right there in the comment yeah, section. Yeah, sure. it's not, uh, let me see. Equal opportunity framed through their experience. So yes. It's, Yes, right, no, no, for it's, sure. it's like that. Remember that, yep. that image of the three people on, at the fence, right? And they all yep. have different size boxes, right? That, that that image. Did I take a screenshot of it? I don't think I did, but but yeah. And the saying like, yeah, their footing is different, right? So, well, it's funny that that image. I, you, I'm glad you brought that image up. And the image for those of you who don't look at that is just basically three boxes of three different sizes, and on the on the shortest on the. Uh, well, three different people of different sizes and then three yes. different boxes that bring the people up to the fence. And yes. people say that's equity. Now I would argue that I, I, there's an article that's written about it. And I would argue like, that's not actually, I think what she, what the, what I can't drag in. Misty. Yes. Misty actually writes is that, that this is actually a better, her, her wording is better equal footing. Yes. Because right. I think that the problem is that they put people at different levels because based on their disability or color, but people are actually at the same we're all at that same place. So one, get rid of the fence, because that doesn't make sense anyway. But it's actually the foundation that's the problem. Yes. The foundation is the problem, not the boxes. Right. Because right? if you have the foundation and, and the foundation is like quicksand, which is really what you've asked black people to do in a lot of situations, you've said, hey, listen, let me, let me, let me, quick, let me put quicksand under your feet and we're all going to start. And yes. the, 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 like I have to do doubly as hard on, in that quicksand to get started and move forward than yes. the person who is, has, has equal footing. And that's the problem. We, we're, we're afraid to address the foundation. We just, mm-hmm. we just want to, we just want to address the things that are that, surface, that, that, like right the surface. Okay. Let's just put a box there. Let's just put a box there and make people feel that they're equal. Let's, let, 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 let's put that, let's lower the fence a little bit so that they have a feeling that they're equal, but let's not, we don't want to change the foundation because we still don't want to empower people to move forward. Right. Right. But you know what's funny though? I had this conversation with one of my colleagues about supremacy, not white supremacy, but supremacy in general and how we're all wired for that. Because I, I could use example within the Pilates community. It's said for some people, like, if I'm a teacher, don't give them everything. Like you, you, these are your, these are your clients. These are your, your apprentices. I'm going to teach them enough so they can be good teachers, but don't give them everything. So they have to still keep coming back to you. So there's some kind of power because I have knowledge. And then there's people like Misty out there who are, who would say to her, her apprentices, like, I want you to be better than me. I want you to exceed me. I want you to be the best teacher that you can be, like surpass me. And when we don't have that sense of, supremacy is a thing that we're trying to hold on to, then that opens the door for us to actually get somewhere. But instead we hold back because we want to make sure that they're just a little bit below us at all yeah. times. So as yeah. I'm growing, you can grow, but just make sure that we still have that power balance so that I don't have to actually relinquish that control you're talking about. It's, you know, this is fascinating because in education, I see this all the time. So I, I, have, I again, for those who, I was a principal of an international school in Japan. And I actually find, like, when I come back to the board, I find in many ways it's laughable in many ways. And not just our, like, just how people do education in Ontario. Because when you looked at it, what happened is, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm a hundred, I believe in, in public school education. I, I, was, I, was, I have it. I have my kids are in public schools. But it's, it's fascinating to see what you're talking about. Because teachers are afraid of empowering students. And yes. let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Online learning. And I've had different contacts with teachers. For when I was working at the international board, to transition to online learning was easy, because what we do is we laid out the curriculum or laid out the semester that they were going to cover ahead of time online, and the teachers acted as facilitators of learning, to expand the learning growth mindset, like allowing kids to do more. They were facilitators of learning rather than the the power people of learning, or like where I'm just distributing. I'm the teacher, and I'm I'm disseminating you, knowledge to yeah. you. Let's, right. let's go through this together. There was no threat so that the kids knew what was coming up content next. 
and the teacher didn't care. And the teacher didn't care if they went ahead for that matter. Yeah. But here, and a lot of times that I've seen here, people want control. So you'll hear things like, well, I can't grade. I can't grade that second half of the semester because it wasn't fair because I, like, I couldn't see what they were doing or not. And that's really just the power. It's just words of power, right? Like it's yes, just control. Yes. Rather than being able to say as learners, as people, we want to facilitate the best of learning. We want mm. people to be able to give them everything and let's just journey together in the learning experience. And yes. my teachers, I honestly, I, I had phenomenal teachers that just, we just, we just, we just brainstormed and did stuff together, but you don't do that in the, in, in kind of a board level. And that's what actually is one of the biggest problems yes. is that people want control from the top down. They want to control the narrative. They yes. want to control what is taught exactly in the classroom. So I remember, right. I mean, I'm rambling a little bit, there's just so much that, that's coming in, is that I remember- No, 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 no. You're, you're bang on. I, yeah. Yeah. I have principals like, you know, like let's say Arnie Ford and, and, and Bob Garten. Uh, yeah. These are like solid guys. And you know what? They took risks and just went off and empowered teachers and did stuff that people was like crazy. Well, that doesn't happen in ministry anymore because this is the directive. This is how you're gonna do the directive. This is how you're gonna do your directive in your individual school. Yes. And therefore, there's no ability to really raise up those those black students and be able to right. try something new. And without people, when, once you succeed, say, ah, I can't control that person. Mm -hmm. Put the control back in. Right. That's part that's of the like... system. That's part of the system. That, that, that is systemic racism. It, it keeps you in a certain bind and in a certain box yes. all throughout so that you can never go too far outside of that system before right. you're pushed down, suppressed, or banished to the corners of the earth at a school that you have no <laughs> impact. No impact, yeah. Yeah. The uh, So basically, and all you just said there is that they, they throw the word collaboration around, but it's really just lip service. I, no, absolutely. It's completely, well, it's, it's, it's lip service within a certain cultural framework and context, right? Okay. I, like, like, I think that there is a little bit of change value amongst people who are like-minded. But don't let people who are coming in who are different than that, right? Yes. Who are going to disrupt the culture. Mm -hmm. And this is all the way across. If someone's going to come and disrupt the culture, that's when it becomes a problem. When yes. they come in to disrupt the culture. And I think that's where this whole kind of next stage is to mm -hmm. disseminate and to dismantle black, like just these systems comes into a, it's going to come into a head. You have the culture of the system and you have a culture that is different than that system coming yes. in to try to create a new system. Right. And that always leads to tensions beyond tension, beyond tension. And each system can't try to dominate. It's got to learn to work together. Right. But the, but the power system has to, the oppressor has pushed so hardly so long that this group is like, if I don't get the most now, then mm -hmm. I'm never going to get it. Yes. And that's, that again is created through colonialism, systemics, like systems that have been created over years. Yes. It's all the way across. That's, that's, I mean, that's why th this is so complex and complicated. Right. And it seems like what you're saying there too, that there is, we esteem sameness as yes. the highest value. Yeah. And disagreement as the lowest. Yes. Yeah, like disagreement or contention or um, like I can't like yeah like where you where you if you're not the same, mm -hmm. you're 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 an you're enemy. rebelling. It's not right. You're an enemy. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's the best way of putting it. Enemy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's 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 fascinating. Yeah. That there's such a threat there <clears throat> with that. You know, anything that's different is a threat. And it's funny, I've had numerous conversations, especially with like, like leaders and pe like, like uh, principals or people of color in the system. And they are, I'm telling you, they, they, these are like top level people who have kind of have to learn over time. And a lot of people, especially in leadership, have to learn to kind of almost compromise who they are to succeed or grow within an organization that values sameness. Yes. Right? But right. what, what has been a blessing in this whole kind of, you know, George Floyd, American kind of mini revolution as people are like, wait a second, I don't have to be the same anymore. And now is my opportunity to speak out. Yes. Now is my opportunity where I can actually say, and I've seen some, le some leaders now be like, wait a second, now I can say, I've got people who I know are going to stick with me now. It's not yes. so afraid to be like sitting in a room with uh, mostly white leaders who say, Shh, be quiet. 
that 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 your 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 opinion doesn't count. Do as I say, like do exactly what I say without even really mm -hmm. saying it. That's changing a little bit now. Yes, and pe and people don't know what to do. People don't know what to do with it. Right. So okay. So so what do people do? Like I mean, for for our people out there who hear everything we've said so far, and they're they whether they're white or black, they're in that context where they're seeing these things unfold. What do we do? Well, I I, I think that I, I think that the the, the the system the people who are in charge need to recognize firstly where they're where they're um, where they're not strong at what they don't know like like yes. like if I have another another like person tell me how I should teach stuff on anti black racism who has never experienced it I'm like really like I understand in other areas but you don't you don't have a clue like you don't you you don't have any idea even how how to address it and I think there has to be room where the uh, the pressure becomes the learner, yes. just as a very basic humble humble step. Like yes. just become a learner here and stop trying to tell black people how to raise their children, how to mm. you know teach 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 to the kids in the school, how to develop curriculum like that. Take your hands right off of that, and yes. you could critique it from a point of like implementation, but take your hands right off. Get, Get, don't even be involved and and follow the lead to how to address that. It's really interesting because you get a report like we talked about earlier, and that report's mm -hmm. very clear. Imagine if you just allowed the black people in your in your organization to set up a ten year plan to to address it. It would yes. be addressed fast. Right. It, like it, like because people would know. Okay, this is all you have to do. This is steps yeah. you have to take. This is what you yeah. can do to protect those kids. But people in the system will always be like, no, 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 no. No, 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 no! Don't, don't. It's don't, too much change, too that. fast. Too much change, too much change, too fast. Well, if you if you allow them to be the the spearheaders of a of a ten year plan, it's not going to happen that fast. But it will be long term. But the yes. harsh reality is, people don't want to change that system. No. Not just that system, any system, policing. Yes. You know, like business business structures. People don't want to really change it. So what they're trying to do is, how can we prolong this and make it go away? So over yes. time, this will die down, just like it did in the 60s, just like it did in the, in the late 1800s, just like it did in the early 1900s. These uprisings happen, and people, as soon as those happened, you know, there's a good book called White Rage. It, it, a con, like, it, it, it counteract, like, there's a counteract of anger that fights yes. against that systemic change. And that's, right. what the, that's what you're seeing right now. And I can honestly tell you, the board... Like like a lot of these words wouldn't even really have addressed any of these things if it wasn't for this major uprising and all no, these exactly. protests that have, right. have to happen. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and you know, when you talk about that ten year plan, that's one of the lines I've been using with a lot of people. Is like when I see like you know we keep talking about this, your black square, your black tile, or like your one your your one novel act of anti racism, and then I turn to them and say, okay, well, what what's your ten year plan? Not not what's your one week plan. Yep. Not what's not what's your Tuesday plan. Like, what's your 10-year plan? Um, so then people do that. But then the flip side to that is something that you talked about in your conversation with your sisters the other day, tokenism. Yeah. Now, with that, the question I have for you is, what do you say to the person who is genuinely on this 10-year plan? They make their first step, and then they get slapped with, well, that's tokenism. Yeah, well, I, think, I, I, I still think that you can't, like I was talking to, I mentioned this to you earlier. Is I, I, I talked to someone the other day, and they they were a great person, and they were talking about their organization. And the moment they, they immediately spoke up and talked about a person in their organization that was black, that was a, the leader, and this is a good example of what it means to be like, like multicultural. And I, I stopped right there, and I was like, no, like you cannot put somebody on a pedestal and expect them to be the token person for multiple yeah. reasons. Number one, there is a generation above us that when they came as immigrants. They, they, conformity is, was actually what they wanted. I mean, yes. they, they, like it, whether you whether you deal with Asian cultures who came over as you know first generation J J Japanese came and they were like, you know what? I don't I want you to keep the language? I want you to become American. I want you to become Canadian. And they mm -hmm. they put and the same goes in many of the black communities. So a lot of us are a part of the system, and I don't I don't want to fault people for that. Like that's not no. fair. That's not fair to fault people for that. We're all in a part of that system. So as we've grown up in that system, we're actually more like the colonial, we've, we've adopted the colonial culture. Yes. So with that, we, it, what ends up happening is if you just take that person and plug them in as the, as the key leader, that only, you're only actually 
building more of the same. So it's not just about skin color. It's about overall cultural experience. Mm, yes. Well, their mindset, right? like you're saying, basically, is that you, you've, you've, you've ticked the box and kept your sameness at the same exactly. time. Exactly. So with that, if organizations don't have that, they need to start bringing external people to start to sit on those, sit on those boards, sit up just in the, in the meetings that can actually confront and call it out and be able to say, listen, we need somebody on our org who's going to sit, come to our panel. We'll hire somebody. We'll, we'll get somebody who can come and sit here with us and begin to help us address these issues and make it a long-term plan so that you avoid tokenism. Because yes. it, what happens with tokenism a lot of times is if, if you do get a black person in there and they happen to make a mistake, they happen to fall, like they, like they, 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 they whatever it might be, then you're right. like, ah, see, that's what happens when we got the black person in. We, they, see, they can't handle it. We, we, we need to go back. It, it gives you an excuse to opt out of yes. institutional change. We tried it. Yes. We tried it. We yeah. tried to hire a black person as a CEO. The, kind of the, the business went down and it's like, come on, man. That's why right. you have to start facilitating at a lower level and having active plans to begin to develop people of color at, a, at all levels of your organization and yes. coaching them and preparing them for leadership just yes. like you would anyone else, but not right. be intimidated when that person comes up to you and tells you you're wrong. Like, like, yes. like, like you can't, you like, can't and that's both. what happens. Yeah. You can't have both. Yeah. Success, well, you need to silence. They can't be a part of our golfing group. We go golfing. I don't like golf. So all of a sudden, because I don't like golf, I can't get into the, like the executive position. Like it's, it's those kind of sense. I, I, I remember a friend of mine, um, Indian friend of mine, he was saying that he, in his context, and it's different mine, but he was like, he tells his wife, he told his wife not to ever make curry. Because in his mind, he's like, if I have any scent of curry on me, these people will not allow me into their system. It's, it's the same feeling all around the board. Like, I, I can't wear my hair like this, because if I do, they won't allow me into the system. As a, as a black woman, I, I can't wear my hair natural. I need to straighten it so that they'll allow me into the system, right? So yes. you have to look a certain way, act a certain way, be a certain way. And right. that's the difficulty with tokenism. They, you have to become to get a seat at the table. And right. people have to be certainly like, no, we want to have more people that aren't like us at the table to make this better for the entire organization. There was research on women in leadership. And the, it said that women in, when you have women on an all-male team and you add women, white, w w when you add those women to the, the table, it, it said, you know, with more females at the table, you have greater innovation. When you, when there's greater inno innovation in organization, you, the more diverse your team, the more innovative the team. The more innovative the team, the more diverse it is. Like they, they don't know yes. which one is causal, but it just yes. showed that innovation came with adding people who were different and brought them on the table. Right. Exactly. Question. So pick up on what you just said. How can young professionals challenge their very white slash European board to push diversity within staff ashley how are you doing good question um you know what? i think that i think that this is not an easy task because the problem is what happens and just to give a kind of a background what happens with um you know people who are white who are trying to, to vote for those like, try to push for those positions they have to find the, the right balance because if they push too hard they get ostracized immediately as, yes. oh, they just think they're better than us. They think that they know better us than us. So it's figuring out, like I always say that a lot, it's, it's reading the room and figuring out like with those boards and those systems and with those staff to see who's open and who's not. Because you have yes. to create a system where you're not the only one. It's impossible to do it by yourself. So yes. you have to figure out who in the room is actually closer to that perception perspective and join with them and begin to put books into their hands and begin to figure out how you can start to look for, and, and even you start to recruit people who might be will, who might be able to fit into your organization yes. or get people to come in for presentations who can talk mm -hmm. about diversity and racism, who are, who understand culture, who understand that they know the culture of organizations, they understand who they're talking to and are yes. able to approach them. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a few of those around that yeah. I could recommend as well. So, Right, right, right. I hope you that know, some, yeah, yeah it, it does. And I think that, you know, what I'm gathering from what, the conversation right now for yourself and just for people who are watching, the currency is sameness. Like, that's the currency. Like, like they want sameness. So maybe it is to look within the system and look within the context So you're saying, the people that are in the room say, okay, so they are different here, but there's the, the sameness still is 
this? Like, what is our objective? Our objective is to have the best education board in the country. So why can't we celebrate that sameness? Why can't we hang our hat on our sameness instead of you looking at the differences that are so scary? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I also think with that sameness is that's, that's where the target breaking down of the system has to happen is that the culture of sameness, like you know, the currency of sameness, right? If you have yes. a culture of sameness, in order to increase diversity, you have to slowly begin to break down the mental culture, the, the mentor structure of sameness. Yeah. So how, the, the, the real question is, how do you do that? How do you, how do you crack that sameness within your organization? How yes. do you bring up ideas that are by black people when people don't even know about it to, and then bring those ideas up and say, actually, this was by this person, right? Yes. Like right. It's, it starts to, it start to break down the sameness and the feeling of sameness in every system. And I know it because I see it when I sit in and they're like, well, this is how we've always done it. So this is how we will do it. Uh, don't you know that you just, it doesn't work. It's already been shown that that doesn't work. So right. why not try this? Mm-hmm. And I know this because when I went to, when I worked in Japan, I, I joined a staff and I was shocked. Like I was kind of like, whoa, like, like it wasn't Japanese culture that shocked me as much as working in a predominantly white organization within Japan. That was more shocking to me okay. than actually Japanese culture. Yes. Because Jap- in, in Japan, I felt that people, they had never, very, very many that had befriended black people before. So when they did, you mm-hmm. were their new, like you were their image. You were able yes. to create an image with people I meet. And yes. for us, it was, we were able to create positive images. So their image of black people is actually greater in many ways than anyone else because we're yes. their first friends. Yes. But for the, for the organization that I worked for, it was like every time I brought up an idea, it was too aggressive. I was too forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, worked for, I worked for a lady who was excellent because she put up with – like we, we kind of ended up – she listened and we, we both kind of ended up being leaders together all the way up. So okay. – I have to get like, that was an example of someone who said, wait a second, my ideas might not have stand. How do I, how do I hear? How do I listen? How do I, how do I work together? Yes. And that actually kept me going to the point that I was able to become a high school principal, mm-hmm. right? Which doesn't yeah. usually happen in those kind of organizations. No, right? Right, right, right. International schools don't often have, I mean, a lot of, you know, people of color on staff, let alone leadership. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's interesting. So that, that it's funny, like that, so that sameness is what we need to challenge um, and, and find that, like you said it before, like working the system in a way that we can achieve our objectives while still playing nice and challenging the, the culture. Like there's a, there's a dance there. Well, where... sort, sort of, because okay. I, 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 the reason why I'm so he- hesitant, I, 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 I'm trying to, I need to articulate because I'm, I, if I have organ, I, I'm probably like probably middle ground where I can, I, I try to, I, I, I'm always trying to understand both sides of the culture, but I have friends who are much more, much more forward in their activism within an organization. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I, and I, I ref, what I refuse to do is invalidate a more forward form of activism for my kind of forward passive balance to and yes. the other, on the other side, the other person who's more of a passive act, activist. Right, so you've got a range of activism, and yes. I just refuse to categorize and say one is better or good. I think all are necessary. I think mm-hmm. my role is more of a bridge. I don't think I'm a disruptor. I think I'm more of a bri- I'm a bridge builder, not a disruptor. And some okay. people are called to be a disruptor. Some yeah. people are called to kind of work within the system as it exists now, and some people are supposed to be bridge builders. I believe yeah. I'm a bridge builder, and that does that means that sometimes I'm a little bit more passive, and other times I'm much more proactive. But I, can, I flow in between those points because I have to be able to change the culture and integrate black people into organizations where they're not silenced. Yes. So I think that's where I see my role as more of a bridge builder rather than yes. a, like, 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 like I, don't, I hate using the term aggressive because I think people take that out of context and I don't mean that. True. But proactive activism versus yes. kind of more of a reactive, quieter activism. But you can't yes. judge the person who kind of gets in someone's face, your your perception, your perceived Malcolm X versus mm-hmm. your Martin Luther King Jr., right? Like perceptions, because right. I think both of those guys were equally as activists. In the, I, I, right. But that's how people's perceptions are. That's right. Yeah, that makes sense. Exactly. Yeah, because they're, they're both equally dangerous because they're both dead. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Right. Like, that's really what it comes down to. Um, yeah. Crazy. 
Um, we were talking before online about success, right? And we we're talking about this equality and achieving all these these you know, what would look like success. Um, we don't have that much time left, but like, yes. I, I just like how we we're just talking about earlier, just defining what success looks like for our generation. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know, can you just speak to that just generally, like, yeah. I don't know where to go with that, but like, it, I just like how you said it earlier. Well, I, I mean, I, I look at my father, and people are always talking about, we want to get to that place. And I think Rad kind of talked this, we want to get to that place where that CEO and, and kind of like the, the, the presidency or the top level. And that's kind of- what Having that seat at the table. Yeah, the seat at the table, the top level yes. of success. And I think that, that that's great. And I, but I think we have to be careful ethically because I look at someone like you know, the people who are in leadership in the US now, and that's not where we want to be. I mean, really, like that's not, that's not the kind of ethics. I look at someone like my father, who you know who came to the, to Canada, raised us as kids, made pretty pretty decent money, is now kind of retired, and I would argue that looking back on his life, he's not looking back on his life effectively, saying, "Wow, man, I can't I can't believe how well I did in investors group, and I just was amazing in, in, in this, this and that, and get like those kind of things." That's not what he's reflecting on life. You know, my sisters and I did an Instagram live a couple of days ago. Um, I think it's posted on my sister's webpage, mm -hmm. Jail, Jail Richardson. Richardson, yeah, yeah Richardson, and, I, uh, and I, I can honestly say that my father, I think, would have looked at that, that. I mean, he wrote us right afterwards. And he's looking at his three kids talking about activism and race and equity. And that is his success. You know, that, yes. that is his success. Not that he's waiting for the next generation. He worked hard and was successful within his generation. Yes. But it also, with that, carries on a legacy to the next generation. And then the next generation is like the six, six grand boys who are, who are hearing us as parents be activists in our own liking. And that yes. now they are hearing and talking and watching us be proactive to combat racism and promote equity. And now they are the next generation of, of, of activists. So I think that when we look at success, it has to be more than just the amount of money or the, it's gotta be how can we influence systems long-term, both now for us, that's what our yes. success is now and for the future. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's so true. Um, right, because that's, that's what Rav was saying yesterday. We, as a generation, we wait for the next generation to do it. And we talk about the next generation and children of the future. And then we sit back waiting for that generation to save the day. And I think that we have created such a great, we, this generation has created a great sense of urgency on addressing things that have been around for a really, really long time. And I think that that tide is shifting for sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I just... Because I'm looking at it now, like I like I mean, I'm one of those people who's caught kind of in the middle. Even of the, it's 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 fanat, fa, f, um, just phenomenal now how me as a as a, I'm unemployed essentially. Like I work as a supply teacher, because the system is set up to not allow people like me to get back in. Like it's just yeah. like you just see those things. So I can't judge my success based on what I'm doing now as a teacher. Right. Right. Yeah. Like because I'm doing right now as a teacher, I'm doing nothing. But at the same time, right, like yeah. a whole bunch of influence there, right? Um, but, but, but so I, if I judged it based on that, then, then it would cause such despair or discouragement. But yes. if, I judge it, if I judge it based on what I can do, how I can change, what I can do while I'm, while I'm kind of waiting for the next opportunity for me to step into, I can start to kind of like build on the, what, what, what does success look like with that? What does success yeah. look like in the moment now? And I think a right. lot of times we're constantly looking to the next place to define mm -hmm. or when I get 500 clients, when I get to um, the moment, rather than saying, hey, I want to have core conversations with like hardly anybody. And no, I want to have kind of core conversations with two people watching. Yeah. And then eventually it grows and then it grows and then it grows. And it, what, are, what is success now in the moment with a vision for the future? Yes. Yeah, exactly. And then, and that's, you know, and both you and I are wired the same way in terms of impact more than a dollar amount coming yes, in exactly. every other week. Right. So um, I just think of like what you're doing now is awesome. Like if you see guys, if you follow him on Facebook and see some of the comments that he's putting, his social commentary is, uh, is really insightful and some really good dialogue that's coming out of that. So I can imagine how much impact you are having on other people who are still within the system and challenging them to just look at things with a different lens, even if they're not going to be those really proactive, aggressive, you know, change makers, they're now looking at it through a different lens, which yep. I think is a massive impact.
which is, you know, it's interesting because that's actually one of my goals. I realize that people are on a spectrum, you know, an anti-racist spectrum. Like, so if you think of it like one to eight or one to 10, and yes. it doesn't matter where people are, but you have to decide where you are. And then you have to decide where your arrow is going to go. Are you going to yes. move more against it? Or are you going to move more for it? And so I just try to, I, one of my goal is to identify where people are and nudge them in the proper direction. One step closer to being, not that the 10 is the goal, but the direction is more the goal than the, than the actual number. And sure. if people yeah. moving there, that's, that's all that they need to really do right now. It doesn't have to be craziness. Right. 10-year ten, ten yeah. plan, not, not two-day plan, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, any closing thoughts? Any, any comments in terms of uh, stuff we've been talking about today? Well, I think uh, in terms of closing thoughts, I think that, you know, people have to, one thing that I think is extremely important is start where you are. You know, whatever, whether you're a person of color or whether you're a, a, not a person of color, start where you are and ask questions mm -hmm. is number one. Yeah. Number two, I think that, like, if you're not a person of color at this moment in time, be a learner and don't demand necessarily from the person of color to give you all the information because suddenly you, wow, now it's new to you. Remember, people have been color have been doing, be dealing with this, asking these questions their whole life. So this is not like a one moment thing for them. So be, begin to, like, don't kind of demand all the questions and give space and really figure out a way to make, make it long term as part of your as part of your journey as to how to fight for equity and equality. And uh, that I think that that's kind of develop a long term plan rather than a, trying to do the 100 meter and like read. I'm going to read 50 books right now. Well, just pick one a month or like one every two months and just keep yeah. that as a as a plan over the course of two years to just yes. keep it at the forefront of your mind that you have to consider this because it shouldn't dominate your life. You know, like, the, the, like there's yes. so many issues of equity all around the world and on so many different problems. Mm -hmm. This shouldn't dominate our lives for the next 10 years. It's one issue and one problem that's major that has to be kind of planned out and mapped out to succeed. But don't overwhelm yourself or, yeah. or, or let the guilt of everything consume you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good word. I think we need to hear that. And people need permission to recognize that it isn't a hundred meter and I they, like you said like that that resonated with me like you don't have to read 50 books this month to make sure that you're you're on point make it a sustained long-term continuing education journey in this path so good man yeah really good um so following you what's what's next for you in terms of your business well, I, I, I've been, you know, we, Martin's been bugging, driving me, him and uh, yep. Alex have been asking me. So I'm actually really looking into to, to pursuing consulting. Yeah, um, really? Hoping, wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, just trying to set that up now and trying to figure out how to um, incorporate that or especially with all the changes in society and culture to figure out how we can uh, begin to work with organizations to begin to kind of address issues of race uh, issue not just race but just organizational structure leadership structure um a wide a wide range of kind of systemic or organizational issues that come up both in education and outside yeah it's good kind stuff, of what man. we're looking at doing yeah. all right good stuff all right so stay tuned there's been more to come on that for sure <laughs> dude thanks for joining me today man. i really appreciate it i glad it's fun actually to do <laughs> <laughs> The whole, as I always say, the whole point of the first date is to get a second date. So I'm sure we'll come back in like a month or so and just look at, you know, where we're at. And, you know, as a teacher, you can give uh, the world a report card on where, where, how we're doing so far. Thank you so much for joining us today on Core Conversations. This organic platform has been made possible by amazing people like yourself. So if you're a Pilates instructor or a movement specialist of some kind and you want to be a guest, please message me. If you're in some other field and you know the messages just resonate with you, message me. I'd love to have you on. All of our messages connect, and for some reason, they all help us in this battle. We're all in this game together, so I'd love to hear from you. Let your words be life to someone else. Check out our website, personalvictory.ca. Click the Core Conversations page to see who our upcoming guests are, and I will see you next time on Core Conversations.